Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for getting on here a little late. I had some Zoom issues, uh, but I'm on now. Happy uh, Tuesday. I hope folks had a um, relaxing, if possible, weekend um, and ready to start the week. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today in our latest uh, town hall, virtual town hall. Today's focus is on uh, update regarding COVID and how we are going to be reopening our campus um, very shortly. Um, so for the this afternoon, I'm gonna have Francesca Fender and David Mimke um, give a presentation. Um, then I will be uh, uh, helping answer the questions that came through in advance from uh, you all uh, for the reminders. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for sending those out. And then uh, we'll be um, responding to questions that come up during the chat. And then that will take us to three o'clock. Um, and additional information or anything follow up we'll take care of afterwards. And we will definitely be sure and update the campus and post uh, appropriate information um, in various areas of campus, such as President's Page website, court coronavirus uh, uh, webpage, um, to make sure the campus is, is notified and communicated with. And with that, I will turn it over to Francesca and David. Thank you. Good afternoon, Highline College. My name is David Menke. I'm the Director of Public Safety and Emergency Management. Hi, Francesca Fender, Associate Director of Public Safety and Emergency Management. And I need to be able to share my screen, please. All right, so today we'd like to talk about the phased return to services plan, which is our plan to return services to the campus. And it's gonna be in a phased, cautious and flexible manner. And first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that's a part of the ICS team and executive cabinet who have worked hard and supported us during this unprecedented time. So today I want you to know that this plan wasn't just something that we you know, devised together and came up with in a room. What we did is look at all the resources out there. And a lot of it is guidance and best practices on how to move forward. The only one that is actually regulatory and is gonna give us specific guidance of how to reopen is gonna be coming from Washington State's Safe Start Plan. So within phase one, we were given special guidance for higher education. And for phase two, we're still currently waiting for that uh, phase two um, guidance. So you can see that we pulled information from OSHA, the CDC, Public Health Department. There's other ones on here such as LNI, and then Washington State's the biggest one that really tells us how to move forward. And before we begin talking about our phases, you know, we want to talk about a couple things that we know are bringing people stress and anxiety and kind of address those first to kind of help reduce some of that. And some of that is that the college is not going to bring everybody back at once. So, you know, some of the things that I hear is people are worried about how it's going to look when everybody comes back all at once. And that's not the plan at all with this phased approach. Uh, Highline doesn't have to keep pace with Washington State. So if Highline or Washington State moves to phase two on June 1st, Highline College, if we don't have the proper resources, we don't feel like we have everything ready, then we may delay that start of our phase two. And it could be a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, a month later. So really we don't, there's nothing that keeps us on track with Washington State's phase two. We do, we can't however, start our phase two prior to Washington State's phase two. So there is that limitation. And then those employees uh, that continue to be in a high risk category or have family members are caring for in a high risk family or are high risk family members, they're still encouraged to work from home. They're still encouraged to communicate with their supervisor 
and make sure their concerns are met as well. So this is the Washington State Safe Start plan that you've seen on the news. And um, I want you to know just from the beginning, this isn't meant for you to be able to read. It's just to show an overview of how Washington State's plan is. And you see it's four phases, which we actually adopted the same four phases and try to align ours the best that we could with the information that we have with Washington State's. So this is our phased return. We're gonna go into it in more detail, so I'm not gonna go over every single phase on this slide. It's just to kind of show you how ours is modeled. The only thing that you'll see that is different within ours is that we broke, broke up part two. So phase two is gonna actually be two parts, which we'll discuss further and go into detail. But we just kind of wanna show you how Washington State has four phases and how Highline College is also following that same model of four phases. Now you see the arrow at the bottom that we can go forward and we can also move back. And you hear the same thing on the news with the Governor's Safe Start Plan. If we go into phase two and never start going up and the risk to the state starts getting higher, we can return back to phase one as needed and so on as we go through these phases. <clears throat> so right now we're currently in phase one and everything is pretty much what you're living right now. We have emergency remote learning occurring on, online uh, we only have essential employees coming on campus, and those are all through approval with our VPs. And, you know, as they are approved to come on campus, we use that information for tracing if needed. And then we also pass that information to the custodians so they can kind of clean those areas in the evening of any areas that were uh, used during the day. And the newest part is that the clinical nursing labs have been approved and are an essential service. And right now they're being held under the supervision of our COVID-19 supervisor. So this is Washington State's phase two plan. And you'll see that the gatherings are no more than five people outside your household per week. So we're kind of following the same guidance. Uh, the one part that we did pull is from the businesses because that's what we are modeling ours after, after right now with the information that we have. Like I said, we're still waiting on the higher ed guidance. But one thing that we did notice about the business and we feel higher ed is gonna be the same way is unlike restaurants, employees can still screen themselves at home. So I know the restaurants, they have to screen everybody once they get to work, but if you look at the business's guidance, they do not have to do that. And I feel higher ed is probably gonna fall within that same category. So this is our phase two A summary. And like I said, we're breaking it up into two pieces for a reason. One, we wanna bring back those employees to those areas to make sure that they acclimate to their working areas and we, that everything is safe before bringing students on and trying to handle everything all at once. So a lot of people are asking, what is this limited services in phase two? And honestly, at this point, you know, without this new higher education guidance for phase two, we don't, we're not even 100% sure what that looks like. But my guess is gonna be that each VP will decide in their area, what is their limited services once the guidance comes out. So once a VP decides that certain limited services such as areas and student services are approved, then we would work with those areas to kind of bring them back onto campus. And it's not gonna be, if we take the cashiers, for example, it's not gonna be all four employees just coming back into that office at one day, trying to figure out how to start working out of that office. We'd probably bring the supervisor back, work with the facilities team, work with public safety, maybe work with our social distancing unit to kind of implement safety measures within that area, whether it's plexiglass, um, screen, you know, making sure that they have the precautions they need there. It might be footprints on the ground where people would wait. But in our phase two, which I'll get to in a minute, we won't actually need the footprints for a reason. And I'll talk about that in a second. And then we also have some guidance that we're gonna be providing to those areas, how to set up their office and then how to best um, implement best practices. And then when we go into phase two, we feel comfortable that employees are back on campus and that the areas are set up the way we want. You know, there's no risk to the employees. We're not rushing. We can start possibly bring students back in our phase 2B by appointment only. And so these would be limited services only bringing back these appointments. And so buildings would still be locked. It wouldn't be, the campus would not be open to the public. Uh, PPE would be provided to anybody that would need it within the employ, uh, for employees and students. And right now, I know the PPE has been a kind of a question that people have been asking about with masks and everything else. 
And, you know, right now the campus itself does not have any policies regarding masks, the wear of masks or how to incorporate that. So that is one thing that we would have to look at and decide if we want a policy around masks and if that needs to go to the PDC for possible, you know, temporary um, policy or even a permanent policy. Another thing we are going to be doing is contact information will be collected from students who do come on campus for their appointments. And right now, we have to maintain that for 30 days. That way, if somebody does get sick, we can go back through who was on campus, who was around them, and who had close contact with those individuals for so we can notify those that might have been at risk. And right now, the close contact, even though we were taught a different way through the course, we're going to use the CDC definition, which is anybody who has close contact less than six, six feet with somebody for more than 10 minutes. And then at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Francesca. Thank you. Okay, so we're looking at the Washington State Phase 3 diagram here. And you can see that this is the phase where operationally things start to change a lot. The huge indicator of that is that you can gather with more or no more than 50 people, which is a huge change from what we're living at right now. Um, you can see restaurants are allowed to open at 75% capacity, movie theaters at 50%, and libraries and museums will be open as well. So quite a bit of a difference between um, what we're at right now and even between phase two. So looking at this, um, I think we can safely assume that the state thinks in phase three that the viral risk of uh, catching COVID-19 will be a lot less and therefore um, you, it'll be safer to gather with up to 50 people um, and that there will probably be a huge decline in confirmed cases in our state in order to um, go into phase three. Next, David, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and before we go into the Highland College's phase three um, diagram, we wanted to hit phase four really fast because um, it seems in phase four that the state is saying life will pretty much resume as it was before COVID-19. Um, we can gather with more than 50 people. Everything seems to be opening back up in four, including large sporting events. So there may be a few things in our life um, that become a new normal that stick around for a while, but it seems like in phase four, uh, life before COVID-19 returns for the most part. Okay, so let me flip my own note page here. Uh, for the Highline phase return to services, phase three, we're working off a lot of assumptions here. There haven't been guidelines that come out for phase three yet, and I think that's because we're still working on what phase two is going to look like. The, I think David already said this, but the higher ed phase two guidelines um, is in the approval process in the state of Washington and hasn't actually been approved yet, which means higher ed hasn't actually been approved to open in phase two when the rest of the state goes into phase two. As of yet, they were still going through the approval process. So um, that being said, we definitely don't have guidelines for what phase three would look like um, in higher ed. But here are some assumptions that based off of the state plan, um, we thought we would probably see on campus. And that's that a lot of our services and our employees would return. It could be that some offices still encourage online appointments for students and online resources but that most employees and most offices and services return in some sort of capacity. Um, though we probably expect to see people, um, some offices on a flexible schedule, meaning there's maybe some employees in offices that work from home some days and work in the office some other days throughout the week to kind of break up how many people are in the office at once. Um, and I think that we will be able to assume that, <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> Uh, we'll be able to assume that uh, people will be able to use the campus more freely again. Uh, so we hope, it, we hope that we can loosen restrictions on conference rooms, um, how computer labs are used, how students are able to use access and walk around places like the library um, or just areas that they used to kind of congregate in and meet. Um, these areas should start to go back um, to being used uh, how they were intended to. 
Um, and then phase four, like the state said, it, it's pretty much life before COVID-19. Um, so we haven't made many assumptions or plans around phase four at all. All right, David. So um, as we start to bring limited services back in phase 2B um, and then more services back in phase 3, we created a document. Um, we've been calling it the Health First document. I asked the ICS to help me come up with a better name and nobody gave me any suggestions. So we keep calling it the Health First document. Uh, we broke it up into two sections. So the first section is kind of a collection of all the best practices that we've gathered from public health, CDC, the state of Washington as to safely, as safely as we can, reopening offices and services. Um, and then it also lists ways in which you can implement this within your own space. Part two of the document is more interactive. We understand that every space on campus is unique and kind of poses its own challenges when it comes to infection prevention. So phase or part two allows offices to talk about their unique vulnerabilities within their team, kind of list them out, and then it guides people, hopefully, into figuring out ways um, and processes to implement infection prevention that will work for your specific office area. So for some offices that might be opening up in phase two, where things are pretty restricted and there's a lot of compliance measures that we have to meet, um, it could be that, you know, let's take financial aid, for example, if they have a service desk that doesn't have a barrier, it could be that we decide to move that service desk, and that is just an example, by the way. Um, we could move that service desk to a conference area space where there's more room to implement um, barriers and other infection prevention measures and there's a lot more room for social distancing in there. Um, so yeah, fit that the part two of that document kind of helps offices design and think about um, infection prevention as it pertains to their specific office. But this in no way means that offices are on their own for implementing these things. Um, and thinking of their own infection prevention measures. This just means we want you to think about it um, in accordance with your unique space. And then um, the social distancing unit will help you um, implement these things that you've kind of laid out and analyzed already. But it in no ways means that you're alone. Okay, um, yeah. Was this the next one? Okay. <laughs> uh, because when everybody starts returning in whatever phase um, uh, gets approved for your specific office, um, everybody is going to need the same exact um, PPE or supplies. We've decided to centralize the um, supplies that we're gonna be gathering. So as your particular office returns, whenever it does, the idea behind this is you'll be um, welcomed back with a welcome back box. Um, and in that box will be spray bottles with disinfectant, hopefully sanitation wipes, cloth masks, disposable masks, and gloves. I'm not sure if David mentioned it or not, but we will provide cloth masks to employees who don't already have one. Um, they are on order. They have not come to the campus yet, but they are on order. Um, and these are based on supply availability. So I'm sure that you guys have imagined that as the state starts to collectively open up and guidelines you know, tell us what PPE we need. Every office, every business, every higher ed institution that's opening up is going to be competing for all of the same supplies. So we didn't want all of our own departments also competing for those supplies with the purchasing department. Um, the college will try their best to make sure that we have a steady inventory of these things. Um, but we hope that we could stock the box with enough of these items to last you at least a month and we'll figure out a process for getting you more um, if you should need more. But that is the idea behind the welcome back box. <clears throat> and then contact tracing, last but not least. Um, David, myself, and Ashley Smith are graduates of Johns Hopkins University contact tracing course. Um, the state hasn't come out yet with explicit guidance about how they want colleges to perform their own contact tracing, but we figured that we would take the course and be educated just in case they do rely on us to do our own contact tracing. So 
Just a quick summary, contact tracing is when somebody is infected. So let's say David Menke contracts COVID-19. I would then go down the roll call sheet um, when he was at the offices and I would see who he was in close contact with from employees or if he had appointments with students. That would be a list we would keep as well. That's the daily roll call you see there. <clears throat> And then if he was in close contact with say myself or Ashley Smith or another one of those officers, we would privately contact those people that he was deemed in close contact with and let them know that they were considered in close contact with somebody who has a confirmed case and they'll have to quarantine for 14 days. Um, this turned out to be an effective way we learned through the course of one of the ways that Ebola was stopped when they had the outbreak. So. It's one of the things that the public health system will be using here. All right. Um, so if we could leave you with a couple, three big takeaways from this presentation, and I'm sure you guys will have a lot of questions. I see the Q&A thing lining up over there. Um, that the return to services is phased. Um, we're not bringing everybody back at once. Um, we're going to follow the Washington state phases. We're going to follow their guidance. Um, it is cautious. You know, first we're trying to bring back employees and see what infection prevention measures we need to implement, how we can implement them, um, letting employees acclimate to what is this new normal that we're in. Um, and three, flexibility. I've kind of seen this example already when the nursing labs opened and they had a compliance uh, sheet that made other colleges cry. Uh, and uh, our lab instructor, clinical lab instructors, and Nikki Bly looked at that um, sheet and they made it work. They were flexible enough to bring our labs back on campus and what and these compliance measures are not always easy, but we've remained flexible. I hope that we can kind of bring that flexibility uh, into phase two, 2A, 2B, and three as well. Um, it's not always gonna be easy. That's why we put in the embracing complexity phrase uh, in uh, phase 2A there because the compliance measures, it is gonna be complex to comply with them, make sure people feel comfortable, make sure people are protected um, and still provide services or try to provide services like we did before this all happened. So those are the three takeaways that I hope you guys come back with. Just as a reference point, this is a list of everybody in the incident command system. Um, we gave these names <laughs> to thank them. And also, uh, if you work closely with one of these people or you kind of have more access or you feel comfortable asking questions to somebody on this list, please use them as a resource because even if they may not have the answer to the question you're asking about our phased uh, services plan, return to services plan, they know who in the ICS could help you answer that question. Um, so don't, I mean, not everything has to come through David and I, we of course don't mind, but also if you're you know, comfortable asking somebody that you see on this list, please use them as a resource. Um, and then I'll get to questions in just a second. I wanted to, did you wanna pull up that phase diagram, David? Uh, so one of the things that we'll be emailing out along with this PowerPoint for you to digest uh, at your own time is the Highline Phase Return to Services Plan where everything that we kind of quickly went over here is laid out. Um, so we'll be sending this out digitally um, for you to go over. Um, and then if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to either send it to David, myself, or the ask at highline.edu email account as well. I'm pretty sure it's a good resource for questions. Um, and it also has some important notes uh, about the phases down at the bottom. So hopefully um, if we went through this way too fast for your liking, uh, or we skipped over something that you found very important for yourself, hopefully it can be answered in one of these documents. And if it can't, then please reach out to us. All right. And did, did you mention these will be sent out this week? I did. I, I think I did, but just in case these will be sent out this week. 
think we're ready for questions. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Francesca. Um, I wanted to make sure I stepped away for about 30 seconds, but did we uh, officially announce who our uh, COVID-19 uh, compliance supervisor is? Did we, did we mention that, who that person is? We did not, Dr. Mosby. Okay, uh, we should go ahead and do that just so we, we let people know. Yeah, so um, we've been working with Executive Cabinet to decide who the COVID-19 supervisor would be to oversee the medical labs that come on campus. And just because of all the work that has been done, uh, Nikki Bly was offered and accepted the position for the COVID-19 supervisor. And she's been doing an outstanding job just implementing everything that needs to be put in place, uh, creating the whole practice, which is actually being used by other colleges and like Francesca mentioned, people were looking at all the requirements and were scared and you know, she was able to create these documents that everybody else was asking for. So really appreciate her assistance and everything that she's done to help get us started for phase one. Great, thank you. So you two ready for the questions? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, I got some that were submitted in advance and then we have a number as Francesca said, in the Q&A, which we were expecting. So um, I will start. Um, Highline has many ways that decisions are made and bodies that make them. For example, to traditional administrative hierarchy, the Board of Trustees, union leadership, faculty senate, um, class, uh, policy development council, for example, the ICS often bypasses these bodies and processes. How are decisions being made as to when to bypass these normal decision-making bodies and processes? And how are these bodies informed of these decisions? All right, thank you for the question. So this pandemic is kind of different than what a lot of ICSs see because a lot of times we're working hand in hand with the police or the fire department or some other agency for an emer immediate emergency that has an imminent danger to the campus. And so on those, we have to make decisions right away with the police and don't always have time to go ask other bodies for opinions or to make decisions. But with this one, we've been able to take our time and kind of look at the plans and look at the resources to make some decisions and take our time to make these decisions. So a lot of what the ICS has been doing in this pandemic is different than what you would normally see. We're more or less gathering the guidance and making recommendations that actually goes to executive cabinet. And within the ICS structure, we have all the members of the executive cabinet as well. So there is a lot of um, flexibility with that because we have all those members within the ICS and being able to meet once a week. And then separately, we have units that also meet and they make a lot of recommendations as well. And one thing that we have worked for is trying to get to make sure that we have representation from all class of employees within our units. So if you take our social distancing unit, we try to have members from the WPA, HCEA, and any other class of employees just to make sure that all voices are heard. And it's not just that one member is gonna make decisions for everybody. We actually ask them to take that information back and make sure that we get input from everybody. So, you know, if you're feeling like you don't know what's going on, you can talk to any of those people that you saw to try to get involved. And if you wanna be in one of the units, I mean, reach out to me and we can see if we can find a place to uh, put you in one of the units as well. Thank you. Don't know what happened to Dr. Mosby, but David, did you want to um, answer the question to the King County mask one? The King County mask directive question? So, so the question, oh, are you back Dr. Mosby? Yes, yes, okay. I have no idea what happened. Uh, Zoom and I are not friends today. So basically, um, just there's a question that, that was uh, provided before the forum and then some questions in Q&A regarding um, mask um, at this point and um, how are they going to be going to be enforced 
they're going to be required, what happens if people don't wear the mask, um, and we will be providing more information uh, very soon about that in terms of um, you know, anything from a temporary policy, I think as David mentioned, uh, to possibly a permanent policy. Um, we are also looking to see um, getting guidance from uh, CDC and also looking at what, what our other institutions, neighboring institutions are doing as well. Uh, we do want to be as consistent as possible, but uh, first and foremost is to make sure that um, as we have people come back on campus that we're safe. Um, so that is our most important thing to, to really focus on. If I'm on campus and I'll be back on campus, for example, I will be wearing a mask, um, not just for to me, but for everybody around. And that's the decision um, we make. And um, we just, you know, I will be modeling that for the campus. Um, but we will have more information that will be coming out regarding mask and max policy. And as I think folks have, you know, listened to the presentation and then also on the news, a lot of this is evolving. Um, and we, things are being created as we go. Because uh, this is very un this is unprecedented times, so uh, that's what we will be uh, focusing on, and we'll have more information sent out shortly. Let's see. I would encourage. There was a question that came out again about um, the phases and what are we doing to better define phases and what expected each phase, um, and making sure that communication. Um, every, everyone understands it's on the same page regarding the different phases and um, again, uh, making sure that certain qu basic questions can be answered. Some of the questions that came through is uh, traffic flow, safety, tracking assumptions should be working from each phase. Um, and what I would say to that is, as David and Francesca said in their, in their PowerPoint, um, and they have welcomed the opportunity to, for folks to be able to review the information, provide feedback. Uh, we, are, you know, again, are learning as we go and we look forward to getting feedback from folks. I know that I had asked a group of our classified community members uh, to come together and to provide um, some recommendations and feedback. And part of that is because many, many, many of our classified community um, is on the front lines and has that direct contact and that initial contact and it's important to make sure that their voice is heard and voices at the table and they have provided um, some some recommendations and feedback which i really have appreciated and we've incorporated those have been many of those have been incorporated into the powerpoint and then look forward to getting continued information and recommendations from them as well um, and i think we had about 10 of our classified community members on campus uh, we had a good number of people who actually volunteered their time, but we have we were able to select 10 representing all the areas of campus and they have been wonderful. So many thanks to them for uh, providing some information um, and recommendations to us that will help us in our planning efforts. What classes are the priority state and institutional for returning to face to face format with social distancing? What are the plans for ABE ESL? It's actually part one of the question. <laughs> yeah, uh, so the state has allowed clinical nurses or clinical nursing labs to return for now, but they actually have a longer list of lab type classes that are allowed to return uh, in phase one. Um, and then in phase two, we expect them to provide us one guidance of how to open up limited services when their um, plan is approved. And then two, they may also add on additional classes that are eligible for reopening under some probably pretty stringent uh, guidelines. Uh, everybody opening in lab or phase one right now, like the labs, um, have to commit to some pretty intense, I've been calling them high intensity uh, infection prevention measures. So um, as we move into more phases, I'm sure the list from the state of what we're allowed to open class and course wise will um, get lengthier. But for now, it seems for Highline, it's clinical labs um, that are approved and some other type of classes. I think 
what was it, agriculture or some type of agriculture one just got added to the list recently as well. So um, I think as we move into phases, we'll see more and more, but you know, we don't open up any type of course unless it's been approved by the state. Did that answer part of the question? And then that would also go for the AB ESL classes. Whenever we get the green light from the state, then we can go ahead and start making plans for any type of course to start opening. Great, and the Academic Affairs Vice President's Office will be uh, providing updates um, about when those programs are gonna be open, so thank you. Um, I think, Francesca and David, you did speak to this, but I'm just gonna ask the question anyway, read the question. What would the phase look like for staff and faculty that has underlying medical conditions? And would they be allowed to go back to the office or would you recommend to continue working from home? Yeah, so at, at least at what we've seen for phase two and phase three, anybody with an underlying medical condition or somebody who's caring for somebody with an underlying medical condition or caring for an individual in one of those high risk categories um, has the flexibility to continue working from home. And that's been added into all of our phased plans thus far. And that's what we've seen directly from the state and the CDC as well. Okay. Thank you. Again, you probably already spoke about this, but I just want to make sure I get, make sure everybody's heard. Um, what happens when an uh, individual comes back to work and is exposed to COVID-19? Yeah, so I guess that depends on if it's a process question or if it's a question more about, I just don't feel comfortable coming back to work yet. Um, so if it's a process question, I can answer it like this. If you come to work and you're exposed to COVID-19 and we find out by contact tracing that you were exposed to COVID-19, somebody from the contact tracing team will privately get in touch with you and let you know that you were in close contact uh, with somebody who had a confirmed case and that to be safe, um, you should quarantine and monitor your health for 14 days and hopefully we'll be able to kind of check in with those people too periodically throughout the 14 days. Um, if this is more of a question about just not feeling comfortable coming back to work and whatever phase two, phase three, that's also completely understandable. And we encourage everyone to talk to their supervisor if that's the case. If you've kind of heard all of the infection prevention um, implementations that we're going to be bringing um, and kind of gone through your office plan and you still don't feel comfortable for yourself, just communicate that to your supervisor. We see it in the state guidance that definitely in phase two, you know, nobody's being forced to come back to work before they feel comfortable. Thank you. Uh, we've had a couple people ask, um, can, can people other than the ones that were mentioned take the contract contact, excuse me, training course? Is that open to people? Uh, it is. We were not specifically chosen by Johns Hopkins University as much as I would like to think we were. <laughs> we <did. laughs> I were personally called by the, the college. But uh, yeah, it's a free course. Actually, if people are interested, we can send out the link. It was very informative. Um, and had some timely information as well. So if people are interested, we can also send out the link to that course when we send out the PowerPoint. That'd be now, great. It would also be nice if they go through it that they can actually be a part of our contact tracing unit and you know help out if somebody were to become ill. Thank you. Is there any plan regard regarding elevators, elevator usage on campus? How should we treat um, using the elevators? David, I feel like I keep talking. Do you want to keep going? <laughs> <laughs> so this one, we would probably have to research a little bit more, but I definitely understand that there would be concerns because there isn't more than six feet within that elevator. So in that situation, you know, we talk about phase 2A where employees start coming back and we would have to look at each building and kind of work with facilities and work with the guidance that we have to create best practices within that area. I haven't personally seen too much best practices surrounding elevators, but we could probably, especially when it's just appointments only, 
you know, find out prior to if there's any access needs and make it available to them. Now with the appointments, we don't have to worry about multiple people in the elevator. That's gonna be when we start getting into phase three, possibly phase four. Somebody's calling the evening administrator. But um, so when we get into phase three and phase four, that's when we would have to start trying to figure out who would have priority of the elevators, what is the risk to the public, and should we reduce who can go in the elevator. So, you know, we're going to have to research that a little bit more. But my, initially, you know, I would understand how only one person would be allowed in there. Thank you. And we'll, so we'll get more information, be able to share that with campus. Okay, thank you. Heather, if you can uh, make sure and get that question, hold that question so we can provide some information later. Thank you. Okay. Are we limiting both phase two sections to the under five people gathering? What size of location would govern a gathering? So, Within the phase two, yes, that's one of the reasons why we were looking at the appointment oldie, so that it would be just the two, you know, they come on campus for the appointment, and there's really only two people there with minimal um, contact, and all the plexiglass would be in place, any of the safety preventive method, uh, measures would be in place, so it's not going to be more than five people, and that's why we kind of worked with appointment only and leaving the buildings closed. Uh, we will make sure that services are spaced out, so like if you look over in building six where we have the cashiers right next to the registration, if it's too close, we might have to move somebody like Francesca mentioned, we might put some services in different buildings. And it's really trying to figure out what uh, limited service each VP is gonna request in their area so that we can work with all those and make something work. So that's one reason we are asking for what limited services would be and trying to find ways to uh, space them out and accommodate them. Thank you. I think this question came up during the present presentation, um, but I'll read it uh, anyway. Where do face regular face to face classes fit? So. Uh we haven't seen any um, guidance from the state yet that uh, talks about bringing face-to-face um, -face classes back. Um, we've seen some considerations that have come out from the CDC, um, but those are specifically titled considerations and we'll have to comply with the state guidelines that come out. So. Um, we will have to start planning for it sometime in the future, but because uh, we're really depending on the state to kind of lead us uh, into what kind of guidelines they like to bring face-to-face -face classes back under, we're waiting until those come out and then we can start um, gathering probably a couple different teams and figuring out how we can implement them back uh, into our, our quarters. But nothing has come back out from the state yet. If you see, if you look at the phase, um, the state's phase plans, you won't even see actually higher ed called out in there yet. And if you remember, that's because not officially yet do we even have the authorization to come back for phase two yet. So um, we'll have to wait for their, their guidelines to come out, hopefully soon. And if I may add a little bit on what Francesca was saying, um, I did check with the governor's office and we are to, we are about a week to two weeks away from getting any kind of uh, confirmation about higher ed. Some um, a proposal was submitted, um, but obviously it has to get approved through various channels um, through the CTC system. Uh, so we were informed it would be up to two weeks before we heard back anything official. Once we once I receive that information, I then will make sure and communicate that to the appropriate folks and ultimately to campus. So it's coming, but we still have a few weeks away. And speaking of phases, um, one individual had, had really referenced, kind of following up to what you were saying, uh, Francesca, is that, you know, phase three, 
just looks, you know, st includes strong social distancing recommendations and barriers. So it seems that um, majority face-to-face -face classes um, won't be back until later phases. So like phase four. Um, so the individual I talked about this is very fluid at this point, but is that pretty much the thinking that the late phases would be, um, the late phases would be the ones that would have the face-to-face -face classes? That is how David and I have interpreted um, it as well. And I think for the majority of people anyway, if you, if you see what the clinical nursing labs have, to, the restrictions that they have to open under, trust me, you don't want to open it until phase three anyway. Uh, there's a lot of preventative measures that they have to comply with. Uh, so I do think that for the majority of face-to-face -face classes, you're right, Dr. Mosby, it's probably not until like a phase three or phase four type thing. And during our presentation, we talked about assumptions. And if you look at the state phases, like phase two, it says gatherings of less than five per week. So that's some of the assumptions that we're basing it off of. So our classes are clear, clearly more than five people. So we don't see it opening up in phase two. Phase three, we're looking at groups of less than 50. So, you know, there's a possibility that some of them could open in three, but it's just hard, you know, we're just making assumptions at this point. Let's see. If it helps to kind of add on, um, for the faculty member that has been in our social distancing unit, kind of also asking these same questions. Um, I told him, I think the best advice I could give him right now is kind of think about what is the most social distancing you could reasonably um, implement in your classes right now? What are the most preventative measures you could implement reasonably within your classes and kind of prepare yourself for that situation um, in the meantime? And then once the guidance comes out, we'll be able to have a lot better idea of what we're looking at. Great. So this was, uh, this question was, um, talking about uh, faculty needing guidance and suggestions around office hours during these phases once back on campus, given the size of faculty offices, and in particular, uh, referencing building 15 and 18, uh, the continuation of Zoom office hours might be best um, until phase four. Yeah, I would definitely agree that, you know, if there are services that we can still provide, via Zoom, that's, you know, that's things that we have to look at. And the bottom line is going to be safety. And then what are the students needs? So is there a reason to bring it back on campus? So yes, we do have students that don't have access to technology, don't have internet access. So we might have to find other ways around it and provide a way for them to have office hours. Maybe it's not within your small con confines of your office. And maybe you use conference rooms for office hours. That's things that we would have to look at during these phases as things are allowed to open up and come back on campus. But if there is a way to do services still remotely, you know, that's one thing we'll have to take into consideration as well, just to keep our staff safe and to keep students safe. Okay. A couple questions regarding plexiglass. I don't know if I said that correctly. Um, any discussions on, on plexiglass placing or using plexiglass barriers or similar barriers that you see in grocery store, grocery store uh, in areas where students interact with staff and faculty? And then along the lines of that, the other question I received um, is public workstation. Uh, will that be protected with the plexiglass partition? What measures are in place for no touch checking student in for appointments? Will face covers be available to everyone? Can we talk about that? How often will these will these stations be sanitized? Do you want me to go ahead and take that one? Yes. Okay. So uh, within, within phase two, you know, we're working with facilities to kind of do a walkthrough. And it's not just us and facilities, it's also whoever the supervisor is, is of that area. So we looked at some of the areas that were possibly looking at limited services within building six. So we walked around with that Dean, it was virtually via Zoom and a cell phone, 
holding it up, looking at the different areas and saying, you know, does this window right here suffice? Should we put plexiglass and can we move this workstation somewhere else? So yes, within phase two, we do want to use plexiglass. We want to use any type of barriers as much as possible. But as we move into different phases, we might start reducing some of those needs as more services come on. Because when we start saying that, you know, groups of less than 50 can come on campus, we're saying the risk is a lot less. And then when we have groups of 50 or more, there's a minimal risk to the campus. So we really have to look at how many services are being brought onto campus and what is the risk to the campus at that time. But I would say within two, we still have a high enough risk that as many barriers as possible, gloves, mask, everything should be implemented. But then we kind of have to see what's going on when we get to phase three and four, what the best practices are, what the guidance is, and hopefully we can start reducing some of those barriers. But if at the time that they decide to bring on more services during phase three and they still are recommending barriers, then that's probably what we're gonna go with is whatever best practice and recommendations are. Okay, thank you. What is the probability for fall quarter, that fall quarter will be able to have face-to-face -face classes given the standard classrooms, given that standard classrooms cannot accommodate social distancing? Um, this faculty member referenced in uh, their department, uh, there was a decision made to list all fall classes as face-to-face, -face, which uh, is very optimistic to the faculty member. Um, would it be preferable to advertise the courses as virtual? Uh, <laughs> no, I, I actually, would, I don't quite know how to answer this without um, just kind of repeating myself um, again, but we really are dependent upon um, the state's phases and also the state guidance. So if we're in phase two and more than likely we're not going to see regular face-to-face -face classes resuming in phase two because you still can't meet with, you know, more than five people outside of your household, um, then I don't, I don't know how the summer is going to look, but I, I would think that I'm not sure we're going to get to phase three by the end of the summer. But then again, I, I don't know. I'm not the one with the data. Um, so yeah, in fear of repeating myself again, we really are dependent on the state guidance and which phase uh, we're moving into. Is and if I, yeah, and if I can add, um, so on May 22nd, the governor had a announcement basically saying that the stay home order for June 1st and with the counties going to phase two, he said that not all counties are gonna be moving to phase two on June 1st and made that announcement a couple of days ago. So the ones that will not be moving forward are the higher risk counties. And as you know, King and Pierce have been in the higher risk counties this whole time. So he's basically saying that some of these counties are going to hold back on June 1st. So that's going to prolong us from moving to phase two as, as well, if that's what is decided at that time. And, and if I would add, I, I would recommend, um, you know, to have conversations with the Academic Affairs VP's office. Um, and the department chairs and, and what have you um, about, um, you know, how the classes are listed. Because when we sent out information, when I sent out information to the campus a while ago about the different uh, options or setups for summer and setup for fall, we had various options there set up so that if we had to change, we could make a change that would be relative, a little bit smoother than what we had to do before and asking the faculty to completely change um, all their their teaching and shifting it on online virtual basically overnight. So um, I would say that that's really a conversation that should happen with the vice president's office uh, within academic affairs and other appropriate people. Um, you know, thing is that we the information that we have communicated out to the community should have options that are there and a, and a disclaimer or a caveat that depending on where we are in the phases that will determine uh, what type of instruction uh, we will be using moving forward. So again, I encourage communication with academic affairs on that. Uh, will we need a doctor's note to be able to work from home? Um, so there's a couple of questions that I'm going to recommend 
um, to contact HR directly. So that is one of them. Um, and in terms of if there's medical bills that are created due to getting COVID at work um, and leave as a result, having to take leave as a result of, of having COVID, I would encourage um, those individuals with those questions or any individual with those questions to contact HR directly. Summer's office will be able to answer that question and provide guidance on there. Um, things will vary person to person, situation to situation, um, but you will get appropriate um, firm guidance from HR. So please, please follow up with them. Air ducts in buildings and carpets, are they part of the cleaning process for prep preparation? So I haven't seen any of the recommendations or best practices discussing cleaning out air ducts or carpets, but they do ask that, you know, a lot of our buildings, the ventilation is directly outside. They don't go from classroom to classroom. So that is one thing we will work with facilities on understanding air ducts. They do talk about leaving doors open, leaving windows open when possible, and try to keep air flowing through the building. And now if you look at the CDC website, there's been a new update this last week, which is they don't believe the spread of coronavirus is happening through high touch surfaces. So they've actually made an update and you've seen it across the news saying that a lot of this touching and fears of touching something, you know, are basically being changed by the CDC. They're now saying that it's through coughing, sneezing. And if you're around somebody and talking to them for more than 10 minutes within six feet, that's why they're in close contact. We talk about that 10 minute marker with being six within six feet. So that is the highest risk they say right now. So if it, that changes and they decide that we need to start steam cleaning carpets or cleaning out ducting, we will take whatever guidance they provide or best practices that they provide for returning. I did send Barry Holdorf a uh, document, I think it was about three pages long, and it said um, how to prepare your business or workstation for return from COVID-19. So I know he's reviewed it and I know he's taking steps towards implementing those best practices as well. So we are getting, we are pretty much at the three o'clock hour. I will, but there have a few more questions and then there's a couple we can follow up with. Um, even when face-to-face uh, -face classes open early-ish, uh, will students in high-risk groups be granted accommodations through access services? So right now, even with our labs on campus, that's the one thing they stressed in the guidance for those labs is that students are not forced to come back on campus so that there is ways to still continue their labs, continue their course from online education. So I have a feeling that this will be the same when face-to-face -face happens as well, that they make sure that students are penalized for not returning to campus. And, you know, any student always has that opportunity to go to access services or look at any of the other services on campus if they feel that they can assist them with coming back on campus. But I don't think they're going to force students to come back when they're not ready. And I think they're always going to put in the guidance to make it available, to, at least for a while, until vaccines and everything else come back, to make it available online and not to penalize students for not returning early. Okay. And the last question for this, we, the, we have a handful of questions that we will answer and get out to the campus. Uh, we're not going to be able to answer them on this particular town hall, but we will uh, answer them and send those out shortly. Uh, but the last question is, what are other states and countries doing for classrooms? Do we have any idea of, of what other folks are doing? It's been a uh, both sides of the spectrum. Some uh, states haven't even closed down and that's business as usual. And other states um, like Washington and California have been very cautious about how they're going to return and you know you'll see regions kind of do the same thing where Washington, Oregon, California are kind of doing the same things and you know even through the K through 12 they're talking about classes are may not be resuming for fall so you know it's really you have to look at what they're doing in our area in our area right now they're just saying it's unknown there's just not enough information of what's going to be happening at that time and a lot of it is you know what's happening with the vaccine uh, I know there's a big push on tracing right now that we talked about, and so that's one way they want to try to reduce the spread is through tracing and trying to quarantine people. 
but uh, to look at what every state is doing, it's kind of hard right now since we have, we're seeing both sides of the spectrum. If I can quickly add on to that too, um, David and I are part of a council of other um, peers from the other colleges in our state. So uh, it'll be a really good learning opportunity for us if those counties, the smaller ones, get to move ahead in phases before us and then maybe eventually get to open face-to-face -face classes before us at their institutions. Um, we have regular meetings with that council um, and hopefully they'll be able to share some of their uh, planning efforts, what worked, what didn't work, um, and we'll get a lot of firsthand experience um, information from that council if those institutions open up uh, before we do. Well, thank you, Francesca. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you all 230 plus people who joined in. Um, we hope that you found this um, information helpful. We know there's a, still a lot of unknowns out there. Um, the team and the campus is doing the best we can to try to make sense of all this and put things together. Um, and again, the primary focus for our campus is to make sure that we are practicing um, we're being safe um, and we're being intentional in all of our decision making. Um, the questions that were not answered in this um, town hall, um, Heather has captured them and we will be answering them and sending those out. If you have additional imp questions that come up later on, um, as Francesca said, the ask at highland.edu is a great place to send those questions um, and they get routed to the appropriate people. David, Francesca, and myself are always available um, to, I'm volunteering those two, but they're always available to, to answer questions. And again, a special thank you to both David and Francesca for um, great information and their leadership through this uh, very challenging time. Highline College, have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much for being here and we will talk soon. Bye-bye.